had the, the gardeners and the farmers gathering in their fruits, their vegetables, their grain. I wasn't really looking at it so much as from a Thanksgiving standpoint. But I want to go and look at it from what does God have to say about the worker, about the laborer. So let's go and start off in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day, this chance to get together to, uh, to proclaim your word. Just help me to uh, be accurate in how I proclaim it and how I share it, to be an encourager of uh, those here in church. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, if my wife gets up and walks out in the middle of the service, it's because I gave her my pager. I'm on call, so please do not follow her out. topic I'm going to be preaching on is one that Pastor Stuckey didn't want to preach on. The other elders didn't want to preach on. They all kind of pointed at me. I'm not sure what that says. And when I have preached before, I often like to see what other pastors have had to say, what sermons have been out there. And you can often find a broad selection of pastors with very good sermons. On this one, I could only find two. One of them was John MacArthur. And his comment was, I didn't want to preach on this topic either. <laughs> so maybe I should copy John MacArthur and say, I don't want to preach on it either. And the reason why John did was because he'd preached on 1 Corinthians chapter 8 the week before, and 9 came after 8, and he said I was preaching through the Bible, so I had no choice. He said there's some topics that are difficult to preach on because they're difficult to understand. There's other topics that are difficult to preach on because it's something that strikes near to the heart, near to, you know, the pastor's heart. It's something that maybe he's not doing right, that he has to go and be changing. Or maybe there's other aspects. But this one was a difficult passage to preach on because it talks about pastors, Christian workers, and receiving a salary. So as he was saying it, he said, it seems almost presumptuous for me to get up here and to be preaching and to be saying, I need to be paid. I need to be rewarded. His comment was his church rewarded him very well and that they did not have to go and be changing things. And most pastors would go and say, submit, I would think, that they receive a blessing. They receive hopefully a financial blessing, but also a spiritual blessing by proclaiming the word. In 1 Corinthians 9, 4, 4 to 12, we read, Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas, that's Paul, or Peter, excuse me. Or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about the oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us. Because whoever plows and threshes, threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If you have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain or while it is threshing. In reading the Bible, it's important to take words and verses in their context. What do the verses around the verse you're looking at have to say? What do other verses in the Bible have to say? How do they expand upon this? Is this just a verse to tell us how we're supposed to go about threshing our grain that we've harvested, that we've cut? Is this a verse on how we're supposed to treat animals? It does go and say that, we are supposed to treat animals well, but it's more. In Judah, as in modern Syria and Egypt, the larger grains were beaten out by the feet of the oxen, which were yoked together, sometimes dragging a sledge behind them. 
And day after day, as they trod around the wide open spaces which formed the threshing floors, the animals were allowed to freely pick up a mouthful when they chose to. It was a wise human regulation that was introduced by the law of Moses. But the context of chapter 25, verse 4, is not about animal husbandry. It's about how should we be living our lives? How should we be working in churches? If you go and you look at the verses before and after it, you find that we're really talking about both social and economic things. The verse before it, but the judge must not impose more than 40 lashes if the guilty party is flogged, it's talking about penalties, penalties that would be induced upon people found guilty in Israeli society. The verse after it, in verse 5, where we talk about if brothers are living together and one of them dies, we're talking about what to do to carry on the family name in the Jewish society. So why would God, suddenly in the middle of talking about penalties and carrying on the family name, cultural rules, toss in an article about animal husbandry? It would seem that in this context, as you go and you look at it, it's a lot more. And then if you look at other scripture, you find out that it is more than just talking about animal husbandry. If we go to 1 Timothy 5, verse 18, we read, For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing and the laborer is worthy of his wages. The laborer is worthy of his wages. How many of you feel you're worthy of your wages? Is there anybody here that feels they are not worthy of their wages? If you are, I'll be glad to contact your employer or the people that you work for, your customers. How many of you would be willing to work at Procter & Gamble for free? Any takers? No takers at all. We all feel that we're worthy of our wages. But then it talks about the person that is due double proportions. If we look at the verse before that, verse 17, we read, The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So we're supposed to go and especially hold up those that are proclaiming the word, proclaiming Christ, proclaiming the good news. I like how it reads here in the message, give a bonus to the leaders. When was the last time that you heard of a church giving their pastor a bonus? Here we are coming up to Christmas time, the end of the year, when it's customary for many businesses to go and award bonuses depending on has, have certain production quotas been met, certain other goals, but when was the last time you've heard of a church saying to the pastor, well done, good and faithful servant, here's your bonus. In Luke, we read, Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. The context of this is, as the disciples were going out, as they were ministering, they were supposed to be ministered by the recipients of the word that they were going proclaiming. In every town, they were to find a worthy person and stay with that individual. Such worthiness would be a favorable response to the message preached. Those who rejected the message and failed to welcome the apostle, apostles were to be passed by. The apostles were to shake the dust off their feet as they left an inhospitable place and symbolized the rejection of the Jewish city as if it were a despised Gentile city. The Lord said that the judgment on the people that did not honor the workers and did not hear his word would be worse than the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. If we go to Matthew, we read similarly that the worker was not to acquire gold, silver, or copper, but why did he not have to worry about taking gold, silver, and copper on his trip? 
The reason was because he was going to be provided for by the people he was preaching and um, proclaiming the good news to. For the worker is worthy of his support. In whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it and stay at his house until you leave that city, that he would be provided by those people. The one who has discussed this topic the most, though, is Paul. Paul discussed it in his letter to the Corinthians. And if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, We read, For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. And then Paul asks the question, Is it about the ox that we're reading or that we're talking about? Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us, because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing the harvest. How many of you, while working in tilling your garden earlier in the spring or hoeing and pulling the weeds this summer or watering it we're saying I'm doing this so somebody else can go and enjoy the fruits of my labor anybody we all were hoping to partake in the harvest as we were busy working and is it for the oxen that God cares is the animal the ultimate object for whose sake this law was written? No. God cares. God does care for the lower animals, but it was with the ultimate aim of the welfare of man, the head of animal creation. In the humane considerations shown for the lower animals, we are to learn that still more ought to be exercised in the case of man, the ultimate object of the law, and that the human laborer is worthy of his hire. If we go to the message and see how it's stated there, he gets kind of strong in the way he says this. I'm not just sounding off because I'm irritated. This is all written in the scriptural law. Moses wrote, don't muzzle an ox to keep it from eating the grain when it's threshing. Do you think Moses' primary concern was the care of farm animals? Don't you think his concern extends to us? Of course. Farmers plow and thresh expecting something when the crop comes in. So if we've planted spiritual seed among you, is it out of line to expect a meal or two from you? Others demand plenty from you in these ways. Don't we, who have never demanded, deserve even more? Don't muzzle an ox. We take a look at 1 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? As you're going through here, you see six different ways that he goes and he says, there's people that serve, that do work, perform labor, and they expect to go and share in the reward at the end of that time frame. First, we go and we see the soldier. It's customary for us, especially as, as we just celebrated uh, Veterans Day, to go and be saying, we need to go and be taking care of the soldier. We don't expect the soldier to provide his own uniform. We don't expect the soldier to provide his own gun. We don't expect the soldier to provide his own ammunition. We expect that the country will go and take care of the soldier both during the time of battle and then afterwards. We expect the soldier to be taken care of, not to fight at his own expense. If we take a look at those who plant a vineyard, the person that plants the vineyard expects to be able to reap some of the fruit from the harvest of the grapes. The shepherd tending a flock does he expect to go and receive some of the rewards? I often think of even David at the time when the interaction with Nabal and Abigail. He was expecting at the time of the shearing of the sheep 
to go and receive some kind of reward from Nabal for not for protecting the sheep so that Nabal's sheep were not attacked by marauding bands or others. You can see by Abigail's response that she thought that David's comment and desire was a reasonable one. But yet, uh, Nabal was the fool and said, no, I'm not going to give to the person that's helped to go and provide for my flock. As we talk about people battling for the Lord, soldiers that are out there proclaiming the word, shouldn't we be thinking about onward Christian soldiers and how we're taking care of the Christians that are proclaiming God's word? Looking at verse 8, 9, and 10, I'm not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. At this point, Paul is going back in time to the Old Testament and saying this is not something I've come up with myself. This is not something that's a new idea. This is something that Moses told us that we should be doing, that we are supposed to allow the person that's doing the labor to reap the rewards of their labor. He's saying that the Old Testament substantiated this principle of remuneration. He also then brings up, the plowman ought to plow in hope and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing in the crops. Going to 11. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we do not use this right, but we endure all things that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Paul's illustration goes and talks about the principle of community reciprocity. Beneficial service should be rewarded. If Paul had been used to bring spiritual riches to the Corinthians, Material recompense was surely not too much to expect. Paul also goes and alludes that others have received similar rewards. Talks about Cephas bringing along a wife, which meant both Alistair um, Begg and John MacArthur talk about oftentimes in Christian service, and I have to say I've sometimes been on this, being a board member up at Montrose Bible Conference, we think about, well, can we really afford this speaker or that speaker? And we say, well, we'll do this. John MacArthur's response is, rather than saying we'll pay him $150, let's be generous. Let's give him $350. let us go and bring his wife along. How often can we, if we were going, saying we're going to take care of the whole family, avoid problems for both the individual and the family and the church down the road? that it's important for us as a congregation, as a church, to be thinking about not just the pastor, but the, family, the, the wife and the rest of the family. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. In the Old Testament, it was common for the priests to go and be able to take part of the sacrifice and use that to go and sustain themselves. Were there times where this was carried too far? Absolutely. We hear about Eli's son and how they were misbehaving. But still, God had said, it was important for the priest to be able to receive a portion of the sacrifice to sustain himself. So those who proclaim the gospel should be able to get their living from the gospel. And in 15, 
But Paul then says, but I have not used any of these things. I've used none of these things. I am not writing these things so it will be done so in my case. For it would be better for me to die than have any man make my boast an empty one. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. The preacher of the word should feel compelled to proclaim the good news. Paul didn't want the people that he was preaching to to think that I'm preaching so that I can go and get wealthy. Unfortunately, there's some people today that that is the way they act, and that's almost what they say. Give to me, give to me, give to me. Paul was saying, I'm here to proclaim the gospel, the good news, and I want you to realize it's a free gift. It's not something that you have to pay me for. I am compelled to go and proclaim the good news. The flip side, though, is the workman is worthy of his wages. Don't muzzle the oxen. For I do this voluntarily. I have a reward, but if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge, so as not to make full use of my right to the gospel. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. I have made myself a slave to all, that I may win more. We've been blessed here at Community Bible Church to have people that have given of themselves freely. We've been blessed here at Community Bible Church to have Pastor Stuckey proclaim the word of God. For those of you that have been here for a while, you know that he works, does this free of charge. He does this as a tent maker. We've been blessed in uh, all his teaching and proclaiming the gospel. But he's the first one that would tell you he's not going to be able to proclaim the gospel here in a physical body forever. At some point, things will change. We don't know when that some point's going to be. At some point, we will have to be calling another pastor to this church. At that time, I would anticipate that pastor would have a wife. Good chance he'd have a family. At that time, the blessing we've received of Dave giving of himself freely will come to an end. That we'll have to go and be paying a salary for a pastor. At that time, there's going to be some changes that will end up having to be made. Either there will have to be increased giving for that pastor or decreased spending on other areas. This church has been a very generous church. We've been very generous to missions and to other things. But then the decision will have to be made, what's going to change? So we don't know what the future holds. We know who holds the future. But as an elder board, we wanted to encourage you, make you aware that at some point we'll be having to call in another pastor and be having to meet that expense. And that it's a biblical thing to go and be saying that we as a church will be paying that pastor. Do not muzzle the ox while he's treading the grain. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for how good you are to us. We thank you for how you've blessed us. We thank you that you have um, graced us with this church. Help us to be good stewards of what you've given us. In Jesus' name, 